Aliona, and welcome here today. And we're here to, to talk about your, um, your book. And, uh, but first of all, let me introduce yourself. To introduce yourself. Then you were born in Kiev. You have a PhD in history. And you are currently a professor at the University of uh, Kiev National University of Culture of Art. You, you've done many, many things in your life. You are a PR expert. You've been managing more than 20 uh, campaigns at the national, international level. And you, um, you, you've been working with very top politicians in this country, and uh, um, including uh, Viktor Yushchenko, who led to his victory. You uh, created your company, Ross Group. And, and you've been involved in a different uh, project uh, here in Ukraine and on the international scene. Alina, my first question to you um, has to do with the literary role of a pseudonym, because you used the pseudonym Ali Blank uh, for this book. Um, and I was in interested to know why you feel pseudonyms are an important uh, 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 phenomenon today in literature? What part do they play in modern culture? And how are they related to technology? Pseudonym, pseudonym is very important. It's a uh, choices. Uh, will you tell um, uh, many, many questions uh, and um, uh, text life and the real world in era of uh, digitalization, gamification, uh, I don't know, uh, Twitter, virtual worlds, uh, where everybody can to be writer, everybody can to be a photographer and can um, use uh, the pseudonym. So Elie Blanc is a universal pseudonym for universal story for me. It's really interesting that the pseudonym has taken on a life that actually exceeds the life of the real author. Uh, which seems to underline uh, what you're saying, Alina, about the importance of pseudonyms uh, in online culture. Without mystery, very difficult to find out uh, uh, the right uh, readers who understand you. From my point of view, now it is uh, um, writing. It is a more communicative process than uh, the yes. creative for something like professional skills, yes? It is only mm -hmm. about the, mm -hmm. um, looking for somebody who close to your spirit. To, uh, to your mm. message, to your state. It is very important in the modern process of uh, reading the text, much more than, uh, for That's example, right. making a photo. It's uh, cost only one moment, mm. but text uh, costs much more time. Who today, uh, for example, uh, read this text? It's uh, not uh, all mm. people, because people haven't the time to, to read a text. It is the answer. Mm. Uh, not only uh, because people don't want to take the force, they have not the time. In political dimension, for me, power, it is a big, uh, big game. Uh, they deployed uh, for all resources. I mean, not only resources like money, uh, land, for example, uh, no, media, um, lawyer. It is, uh, for me, it's a matter of finer things. Uh, it is also include resources like, um, like, uh, like uh, pain, like uh, love, like mm -hmm. expectation, like uh, mm -hmm. um, disappointed, frustration, uh, hope and mm -hmm. uh, truth for example. Uh, from my point of view, the, in political dimensions, the people very often, very often forgotten about this. Thank you. Um, just, to, just to kind of elaborate a little bit further then on this um, question of the risks that artificial intelligence uh, brings with it for modern political systems. I know that this is something that uh, Nick Bostrom at the University of Oxford and uh, Professor Stuart Russell at the University of California have spoken about. I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more about this in relation to the novel um, and perhaps the post of the novel and characters such as Margaret, uh, who we'll come to later. How do these questions of political power play out for you in the novel? 
Good questions. Um, many respectable professors, like Professor Bostrom, like Professor um, Russell, uh, raised this topic, a risk of AI, before. Uh, but now they are uh, talking uh, that AI Armageddon is um, still uh, way off. I'm thinking that it's a real risk in political dimension today. Uh, it is a risk uh, much more about uh, dictatorship in uh, living many, many years before. What does it mean in the political arena? What does it mean to, uh, to take absolute power in the world? In the space and time. It is not about personality, it is about political system and how this political system is constructed today. It is a risk. It is a risk. Um, by the way, I, um, it was uh, one of the key concepts of my prescriptum uh, about uh, dictatorship. Uh, I was in processing uh, of writing and um, had uh, many variants, many uh, ideas, tempting this idea. And uh, one was about the child, the daughter of uh, General and Margaret, a teenager Alice, uh, who became a want to become to the dictator because she received um, the capacity of AI. But at the end, I decided to um, talk uh, about another story, about a story absolute love, about a story absolute power. Olena, I wanted to ask, um, again, coming back to this question of prototypes, how or what was the process uh, of the prototypes that you worked with um, becoming your, your co-authors, becoming partners in the creation of your novel? Could you say something to us a little bit about that, uh, that process? I uh, very doubt the process of uh, writing the modern book today could be like in previously time when a very professional guy uh, sitting uh, alone in, uh, in a monologue with uh, mind to, to do something. Mm -hmm. Era of digital, mm -hmm. era of uh, gamification gives a new key to this process. And not only mm -hmm. author and how mm -hmm. you to do and who your core author very important. So um, mm -hmm. I uh, very happy live in this time uh, with uh, waiting what's mm -hmm. happened with the text uh, mm -hmm. cultural in the next step, yeah. Some of them was born in Ukraine, uh, also like me. Uh, for example, the Sergei. It is a prototype of Simon, one of my favorite personages. It is at her demand of love. Mm. From my point of view, uh, she maybe could be the new uh, role and image, uh, like in the famous uh, book, maybe like Irene Adler who found out on the questions uh, of uh, threats uh, of protected the world, but at the same time she found out females' approach to this situation, mm -hmm. not men's. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not could be the James she, Bond, she because James Bond is a line of men, of course, from my point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this case, mm -hmm. we uh, came to talk about uh, new Iran Adler. Uh, the prototypes mm -hmm. of Taylor uh, is uh, David Foskett. Uh, David, um, from my point of view, have a very interesting background. Uh, he was born in uh, France. Uh, he are living in uh, London now. Uh, his uh, professional professional activities, mainly financial sector. We met uh, with David in London uh, uh, during uh, lockdown, but it's done and it mm -hmm. became the turning point uh, of uh, my novels and postscriptum. Uh, maybe uh, also important that uh, David um, had a big impact of chapters of uh, Ali Blanc. Th this um, personality is similar in philosophy, in uh, uh, interest, uh, and uh, it's uh, today uh, uh, David uh, is um, in Ukraine in our studio, and I was happy to present him. First question, really, um, that I'm I'm interested to know more about is what view you have and how you feel about having served as a prototype for the character of Taylor in Ali Blank's novel. 
Thank you, Simon. Um, I think, first of all, I, I was honored uh, that the author uh, took me as a prototype. Uh, but um, my second reaction was, well, I need to, to read the book again. Uh, because I wanted to ensure that it's really um, my character. And, and then I also understood why, um, uh, when, during um, several uh, conversations with the author, she, she, she was asking many, many questions about some a very precise question about hobbies, you know, how dealing with certain situation about politics, about my hobbies. And, and, and then I, I managed to, to put all the piece together. Then, but overall, I was very honored. Mm. What's um, one of the themes or the, the dual themes of the book that we've already touched on is the relation of power to love. Um, are these absolute terms for you? And in the modern world of technology, terrorism, technocapitalism, how do you see these absolutes as they're sometimes represented, love and power being played out going forwards? Well, first, I think power and love, um, as we will say in French, don't do bon ménage. I think that um, it's very, very uh, difficult for uh, these two elements to coexist together. Um, one, the first one killed the second one. And, and as we see in, um, in a book, um, it's, for me, it's, it's mainly about power struggle, fight for, for power. And, um, mm -hmm. and then in the background, you've got a, te a temptation for love. But um, overall, a very difficult coexistence between the two. Not a simple, easier text. It is mm. the potential you're so other. Uh, maybe it so is all, a all the more, all the more important that uh, yeah. literature and art brings us back to mystery. It brings us back to slowness and taking time. And just to ask you, uh, how did the idea for this book, Transition Keeper, first come about? In my novels, um, then appears many AI, uh, many machines, uh, a lot of scientific information about the larger center of development of AI. But in the result, is it, for me, it is a story about humankind. It is a story about the people who present the different institute of government power, a different uh, group of interest in global crisis. How would you um, describe the plot of the book, um, uh, Olena, I think this is a book about many things. It's a book about gender. It's a book about power. It's a book about technology. It's a book about terrorism. It's a book about love. Love is a mighty power. There, it is not a duality. Lo love is a power. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't be too quick to see them as an opposition. Um, but I wanted to just uh, move on slightly from there. Uh, to raise the question of um, uh, contemporary threats, which, which this novel is very much engaging with. Uh, I'm particularly interested to ask you about this relationship with uh, terrorism and cyber terrorism. How do you see the question of political threat and political violence and political crime being, being, being played out now in this contemporary world of cyber terrorism and the possibility of cyber terrorism. Is this something which you think is changing, is evolving, and is it, does it raise new anxieties for us going forward? Well, I think it's a daily concern because uh, yesterday it's very much uh, you've got all these cyber attacks, you, you've got fake news, which is part of it. And uh, yes, it's, um, it's a daily uh, threat, um, which is quite concerning because um, you can target um, a group of people, destroy their reputation, and it's very difficult to rebuild it afterwards. Then, yes, it's, uh, we're living mm -hmm. a very... Um, um, dangerous time because it's it's totally virtual. You don't see anything, but it's mm -hmm. ha happening very very mm -hmm. quickly. 
Mm. And this this question, as um, Boris Johnson is finding in the UK at the moment, of reputational damage <laughs> conducted through the media, uh, is 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 um, is very real. It can destroy people's political careers. It, it is very real, but it's very difficult to hear what, what he has to say because um, everybody is focusing mm. on the scandal of the, the garden parties. Then, um, yes. That's right, that's yeah. right. And some people feel that these are, might even be distraction techniques from other things that the government are, are, are doing or not doing. But you mentioned, David, Ukraine, which brings me to my next question, um, which I feel because, uh, because it's such a contemporary. Um, drama at the moment with the Russian troops positioned as they are um, on the on the Ukrainian borders. Uh, I just wondered if you could offer us some comments on that. Uh, it's generating clearly so much political conversation. How do you assess that situation at the moment in relationship to the uh, global political, economic, and military picture? How do you see this uh, Russian challenge playing out uh, in the future? Well, well, I think that, unfortunately, Ukraine is right in the middle. And I think what we see here is it's beyond Ukraine's problem. It's that we, we see the, the, mm. the renaissance of uh, the two blocks of influence. And Ukraine is right in the mm. middle. Um, I, I, I believe that, I hope, uh, things will move in the right direction and we'll, we'll avoid the worst, uh, but it's beyond Ukraine. Mm. I think we see now it's global threat. It's uh, power of influence mm. of uh, like what we used to see during the Cold War. We're going back to this era, mm. I'm afraid. But, but also I wanted to add something on this. It's also a very strong message for the rest of the world, uh, for democracies. Um, mm -hmm. young democracy to be able to, to choose their future. It's also very important. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If um, we don't find the right issue, they will send the wrong signal to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. That question of self-determination. Yes. Mm. Thank you, David. Yeah. And this is a question again to you, uh, Elena. When you met uh, uh, David and when you met uh, Elena, did you know that they would become characters in your book? Did you immediately understand that they would have this role or did, was it a slow process of realization? I feel very strongly it becomes public property it doesn't belong to the author or the artist anymore. But at the same time, it's very interesting to ask what is the intention of the author, of the artist for the work. So I thought as a final question, I wanted to ask, what is your intention for this novel? How would you like it to be received? Mm, thank you for your questions. Maybe it is, um, uh, I have two options, an investigation and your time, it's my term, and the letter mm. for the future, for our mm. children, because if you remember the, uh, the final line of the story, the Margaret has died, but mm. she gave message to uh, the children and uh, said that uh, now your term. Uh, my dear children. But the thing is that if we exercise power to change the reality in a non-natural way, we always harm it. There is always a backfire. There is always something that um, will remind us that we are not gods. And power shifts to, as actually in the book was described, to being bodhisattva bringing bringing peace first in one's own soul and then into souls of others and bringing peace and bringing light bringing acceptance and possibility to think and see the world deeper and then 
inspire actions from the deep understanding of reality. This is the actual power from my point of view. And probably we would remember some people like Alexander the Great or Stalin or whoever, Lincoln, those who were great, and who changed a lot. But even in the course of 10,000 years, those names will disappear from the memories of people. We will forget the, those names. Only deeds will remain in the history and it will be heritage history. It won't be written potentially, but it will be in forms of culture, in forms of action, in, for, in form of genes that you transferred, even like this. So the power is possibility to, to do something sustainable that will, so, that will survive longer than the memory about the person somebody up it's not only about like uh, raw power when you can capture somebody it's more about the influence uh, since like one person if he has a power of voice he can influence a lot of people especially in the 21st century when we have those social medias when you have trump <laughs> who was banned from twitter for a reason because well he was par powerful in my own uh, humble opinion for well not so smart people because his words weren't that smart but anyhow he was influencing a lot of people he was using his power to gain well what he wants he was um, as far as i remember he was influencing the last election till the end so that's how the power goes if, if i do have ultimate power probably i can have unlimited lifespan like i can live forever and stuff and that means i can try all the different theories see like what will it be if people live by my rules what will be be if people live in chaos what will be if well, i can prove that god exists and god is me or vice versa so well then we will be living good and everybody will be living as they do now <laughs> maybe like that uh, but that's uh, when i return to my like first point i cannot say for sure what, what i would do because well as we know power corrupts there are experiments which which proves that power corrupts people when especially when they can control other people so you never know what you will actually do if you do have unlimited power and that's I believe one of the hardest questions which will never be answered because there will be no ultimate power for for one person well probably hopefully does the political class still have legitimacy this question is being asked in the uk and parliaments of the british government as we speak um it's played out in america with uh, Trump's election, um, or would David be sympathetic to uh, Plato's view that the best people to take power would be people who do not want to take power? Yeah, no red light. Oh, yes, now, yes. Yes, um, I, I think it's, it's um, I agree there's, um, nowadays uh, politicians are more and more disconnected from um, most of the people. Uh, and that's why now we, we saw the result of the election in the US and in, um, in, in England with the result of Brexit. And, um, and that's why I believe that it's not really about whether you are part of um, um, a, a political class or you are out, out, an outsider. It's very much about your belief. Are you going to, to serve a country or are you going to just to, to go for a personal agenda? And that's the real problem nowadays. Most of the people go to, into politics. I believe mm -hmm. the level is going down. It's most of the time is to address a personal agenda, not to serve the people. That's the problem. And what, we, what we've seen in, in the States with, uh, with uh, uh, Trump, the cult of personality, who, 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 that is his uh, political objective to, to, to engender a, a cult of demagogic personality. Yes, but it's uh, it's not only in um, in US. You you see that all around the world now. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you see this, um, okay, probably it's not an right example, but you see it in the US, you see it in, um, in Russia, you see it in, uh, mm -hmm. even in Europe. Um, when you, you looked about all the different countries in Europe, you see that all around the place. It's, uh, and that's why mm -hmm. there's a, a bigger, bigger discontent. Uh, in um, mm -hmm. the, the, the politics uh, from most of the people who, who see life getting harder and harder every day and, and uh, totally disconnect mm -hmm. with people who power uh, mm -hmm. us. I think democracy is really in danger. And I think that's part of its uh, attractiveness, that's part of its mystery. It preserves some sense of mystery till the end. The idea that the novel remains uh, seductive, it remains um, tricky, it doesn't give up all its secrets. Yes. I think that's a wonderful thing about the, about the novel. Well, I think that's a lovely note on which to just conclude this, this, this section, that uh, this, is, this novel is, I think like all great art, it's in some way a letter, a letter to the future. It's passed on. It's, it's in transition. Uh, it's a novel yeah. about transition, and it is in transition. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name's uh, uh, Simon Thomas. Uh, for the purposes of this book, um, Shimon Solomon is the name that I, I use as my writing name. So it's, it's, they're both me. Uh, Shimon is the Irish version of my name. I live in Ireland and have a lot of Irish ancestry. Having read it, I don't know how many times now, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, <laughs> it may well be hundreds. Um, I'm still, uh, I still have a lot of difficulty uh, summarizing it. If, if you ask me in one sentence, Simon, tell me what this novel is about. Uh, summarize it in one sentence. I would find that extremely difficult. And the fact that I find it very, very difficult is in no way for me a criticism of the novel. Actually, it's part of the beauty of the novel. But if I can just pick up um, some themes, clearly, and we'll be talking about this, AI, technology, and computing superintelligence, the supercomputer transition keeper, which gives its name to the title, is absolutely central. So transition keeper has this kind of remarkable um, piece of technology embodied or personified by a woman, of course, which raises this whole question of gender as well. Um, a supercomputer, which is really at the heart of global development, global future, it can, um, it can evaluate, it can predict, and it can interact with major global events. This is also a book, I think, about genius, about precocity, about children who speak in ways that point beyond mere childhood. This foundational character in the book, which, which gives its name to the title, this concept of a kind of hyper-intelligent, Super, uh, uh, super intelligent supercomputer transition keeper. As I say, it can respond to, it can predict, it can interact with world events. It's really a kind of key political player, isn't it, on the international stage. Now, I want to just ask you about the status of this kind of character, the status of this supercomputer. And I just wanted to mention that the book also is rather tantalizingly subtitled, an anti-science fiction novel. So, which I think is a really interesting, um, that phrase, anti-science fiction novel, is a very interesting uh, something to conjure with there. And I suppose my question is, how much do, do you all feel this rather futuristic concept of a supercomputer, of Transition Keeper, how much of it is science? How much of it is fiction? How much of it is science fiction or anti-science fiction? What's the real possibility here of uh, such a, 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 a powerful piece of technology really stepping onto the world stage in the way that the novel presents? The, the two main characters there are also very applicable to political process as it is defined at the top level. If we look at politics as an instrument for the fight for power, Power always encompasses uh, three key 
uh, stages. First, convincing, and, and we have uh, a representative of a faith or, or spiritual leader who is very much working in convincing. When you deal with negotiations and outright scheming and machinations, then you deal with threats and violence. And so on the other end of the book, you have a member of a military, you know, so who represents pure violence. If you look at the evolution of humanity, you don't only look at the evolution of matter, but you, you look at the evolution of consciousness, which, which again is a very indefinite term. And in the, and this book actually raises a lot of questions which are connected with the terms which are very difficult to define even in scientific circles today. Life itself, very poorly defined yet, except for the signaling systems and self-sustainability, meaning being able to be safe since then. Consciousness versus intelligence and so on. So very, very interesting questions are raised on how to use intelligence uh, as a substitute for the consciousness in the political process, because computers are void and lacking the, the qualities which are attributes of life. It seems to me that one hallmark of technological modernity is philosophically uh, the breakdown between biology and technology, that now human beings have pieces of technology attached to them. Um, even if you have a heart valve, you know, you're partly, you're partly cyborg, are you not? So, you know, there's already that a breakdown then between, a, between that clean distinction between the biological and the technological. Even if you pick up a rock and throw it at somebody, you're using technology in a very basic way. So um, this is what we now see. We now see now increasing extensions of uh, the human relationship to the technological. And we, um, are uncertain as to where that is leading, and this novel, I think, takes its place within that context. But can I bring um, one of the other one of the other participants in at this point? Perhaps particularly Simon. On question of of superintelligence. Um, yes, you Simon, Simon, if I may, you know, to answer your previous question, this is really anti science fiction book because it's it's razor about you know politics. It even more, it's more about psychology. It's about us mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm as people and our leaders and i'd like you know to you know remind a statement one of one of the letter who said that whoever wins the race in artificial intelligence will probably become the ruler of the world mm. and it was said by uh, mr putin mm. so mm. actually artificial intelligence is a, a new mirror of the mankind mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it's a we with it's a liquid mirror. Mm. It's it's about it's about alter ego we see in that mirror because artificial intelligence. It's about us. The book greatly invites us invites us to think about human being being ready mm. to live together with artificial intelligence. What you're saying there, um, you're about artificial intelligence. Uh, something I was thinking about in relation to science and science fiction, um, the way that fiction and science fiction has also always anticipated science. So before we landed on the moon or before the Americans landed on the moon, uh, assuming they did in fact land on the moon, I think we can agree they did. Um, we had lots and lots of, of science fiction works, of films about men landing on the moon. You know, so we kind of imagined it. It was in the cultural imaginary before it happened. We might even say we we imagined it into being.
what are developments in technology, developments in computing, super intelligence and AI, how are they impacting the place of religion? Because we also see, of course, in the current cultural landscape, um, the, the problem so-called of fundamentalism, which is very much with us, which very often is connected to Islam. But um, I think there are also uh, questions that arise here of Christian fundamentalism. These things uh, don't go away. Uh, in fact, if anything, they seem to be in certain areas on the rise. Um, but I'm interested to know what the panel feel about this whole idea of the ghost in the machine, which is perhaps a phrase to conjure with. Are there ghosts in our machines? Or, to look at it the other way around, is there perhaps a kind of a machinery of the divine in which or to which advanced AI is is perhaps somehow reaching out. Humans have this privilege to experience this, including both painful and pleasant experiences within the interaction, when they act and exercise their will into ours. Computers don't have that experience. They cannot feel pain, even if they take a logical decision for some action. They cannot get a feedback in the form of the pain which we humans uh, experience or in the form of love and pleasure which we humans experience. So artificial systems judging us, um, um, that is way, way, way beyond any futuristic <laughs> probability. Uh, we have to recreate the human consciousness uh, and the human being in all its beauty, in all its material parts and, and energy parts and any other parts which we call again consciousness and intelligence for that system to be able to judge us and being superior to us. Basically, you're proposing the system of the highest morality equal to God. <laughs> but in the sense of uh, in the sense of how this is depicted in the book, it's beautifully depicted. As, as you said, it's a liquid mirror. Uh, life is, is uh, a mirror of the human beings going from zero knowledge to the omni science, like God is. From the moment the human beings uh, appeared on this earth, uh, who knows when, they had this urge and, and desire to, to see, you know, the, the most harmonical of all, uh, they, they always wanted to, to avoid the experience of pain and what they wanted to see this harmony and they, they called that harmony and balance as God, the creator. And they always were leaning towards that. But again, they were so uh, little in understanding reality and they were just using this hope that this harmony and order exists on their way to the ultimate knowledge of God. So there is this big difference, which I noticed before the faith and the knowledge of God, <laughs> which basically the knowledge of the reality is. Well, I would like to intervene here and disagree yeah. with Sergei, at least in the moment that gods have never, uh, it wasn't ever that gods were connected with intelligence. The thing is that the, the, the gods uh, that existed before monotheistic religions, they were rather personified uh, passions faculties of human being, mm -hmm. even wisdom, uh, it was still a rather passion than uh, in pure intelligence. And it's slowly the monotheistic uh, religions that started promoting in intellect as one of the major ca capacities or qualities of God, or the, the one who knows everything. This is where it comes, this verum unum bonum, uh, the, the Christian, uh, but also in many ways, very Islamic uh, idea of one God who is the, the truth and who knows all the truth. So all possible knowledge is already there. So uh, in a way, this intellectualization of God is quite a recent thing. When Ali Blank plays with the idea of God and uh, manhood, she takes away this God from the God manhood manhood and puts the womanhood, God womanhood. From the book, I feel that this uh, mod uh, modernity's fairy tale of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that Tori was saying, what Sergei was saying, uh, it was substituted by a myth of artificial androgenity. 
a synthesis of womanhood and virtuality that demonstrate themselves in the transition. You know, as a global society now, as a technologized society, in many ways, it seems we've never been more connected. Indeed, we might even say hyper-connected to each other. And yet, at the same time, and perhaps the COVID pandemic has catalyzed this. Um, on the other hand, in many ways, we've never seen so isolated, so lonely, and so kind of socially atomized. Um, it's a paradox, is it not? That on the one hand, we've never been so in touch. We've never had more technological ability to connect to each other through the internet, through social media, uh, through iPhones, through uh, dating and meetup sites, Tinder, you know, so many different applications and so many different programs and software opportunities to connect to one another. And yet our ability to, to love, to impact one another lovingly, to receive love, you know, in a meaningful way seems to me in many ways to have been very diluted. I think what we see here is basically the era we live in where um, everything we do in life uh, is based on quantity very often, uh, more than quality. Uh, when you talk to colleagues uh, after the weekend, they will always have to over express that they had, you know, super weekend, they did uh, super extra things, and which to me uh, show extremely superficial, but doesn't show the reality. Then, uh, yes, nowadays with technology, we've got access to, uh, with social media, you can have worlds all around the world, friends all around the world, but you don't know them. And it mm -hmm. appears to me one day I met a guy who was part of my network, which I was in contact, and I, and I saw him physically, and he didn't know me. <laughs> and, and therefore, this got a direct impact of love because um, we believe in quantity and not in quality. And this got a direct impact in love because I don't believe we can love more than one or two individuals. Um, but you see this with something like Facebook Friends, uh, exactly as you say, where it's almost a matter of social media status how many friends you have and people might have hundreds of friends as you say many of whom they never have met and their their, their status on those uh, social media sites is it is, is registered by the number of friends they have but w with whom you know they have really theoretical relationships rather than actual ones so i think that's a, a well-made point about quantity and quality the west is obviously uh, full of solitude Contemporary Western literature, for example, reproduces lonely Robinson Crusoe mm. uh, all the time. Crusoe is a hero of loneliness that will be repeated in Faust, that mm. will be repeated in uh, Elementary Particulars by Begbeder. So it, 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 it's the topic. And in, in every generation, you have to decide how to do it. Well, Milton is also about this. Right. Uh, it's very, um, it's very uh, Western. And the West is basically a myth that unites some parts of Northern America and Western regions of Europe. It lives from the blood that stems from the torn body of Lady Europe. Mm. Uh, unlike most of her protagonists, Ali Blanc comes from non-Western Europe, and she's able to use love to heal and unite. And this super synthetic order is the plan of a transition keeper, which is very Eastern European idea or even social psychological complex, something repressed that comes back as this idea of let's reunify. Mm -hmm. Also the idea in the book of this new Babylon is also a reference to erotic force of non-Western humanity. After the relics of the real Babylon were bombed in humanitarian war three decades ago, the new Babylon was needed indeed. You, you have to reconstruct the world after everything the West during its dominance have done to it. Well, it doesn't mean that the other parts uh, of the de-Westernized world will behave better, but this is definitely the plan. And it, it's the intuition of uh, Ali 
uh, that is also coming up to the to the, the four four scene uh, to the scene uh, in this novel. Certainly, loneliness is nothing new in the Western tradition. It runs through Romanticism, of course, um, but perhaps this kind of um, paradoxical uh, conjunction between loneliness, isolation, atomization, and intense hyperconnectivity. Perhaps that is something new. That on the one hand we're, as I say highly connected and connectable and yet this seems to in some way enhance or enlarge our sense of loneliness even though we still chase after these kind of myths of monogamy and and the one and the one love we're we're somehow doing it in a much more complex um environment any further thoughts well, it, it goes in line with what michael and david said uh, the the current a trend of accumulation versus realization accumulation of wealth or accumulation of experiences and especially fast accumulation versus realization actual practice of what you prophesy and, and here is an old legend uh, where the love and separation stand near the field where two lovers are standing and they place a bet how quickly separation can separate them but love says give me a second i will put a spark of love between them and, and then we'll we'll see what you can do uh well separation comes and sees that there is love between them she can't do anything says i'll come later and then she comes later and then there is uh, a, a gratitude between them and she can't separate them and then again there is um, respect between them and there is trust between them ultimately and then the understanding and at the end she comes and one of them already died but the other one has memories of all those qualities and in order to exercise those qualities you actually have to go into the physical interaction with a human being for a, you know for a certain period of time Mm -hmm. uh, but we using technologies we try to expedite it but we kind of you know make it less of value and th this is where there is an issue i don't see any issues in technology helping us finding partners even quicker but then you actually have to exercise it physically and experience that qualia physically versus virtually but other than that technology you know again has to be used wisely which which again comes with experiences and you can't rely that everybody will use it wisely so my first question david is to you i was really thinking about this question of branding um because in the novel we have transition keeper and in effect the novel is exploring how transition keeper is to be so to speak branded how it's to be presented how it's to be, so to speak, marketized. And obviously, as we've touched on already, most notably through its association with a woman, through its kind of female personification. And I was wondering if you could say something about how you kind of see in your in your capacity as a consultant in this in this area, how you see the kind of evolving concept and role of, of kind of brand identity in a globalized marketplace. And, and the emphasis here in my mind is as much on identity as brand. If we think about white labeling, um, we have a kind of a, a kind of a new development whereby products can be taken up and 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 remarketized and in a sense um, depersonalized, de-individualized in that respect. First of all, the uh, white labeling is is very much um, um, a a technology uh, point of view because basically it's a, a brand is uh, decide to move to another market than their core market they're basically they're, they're using um, a, a technology provider to tackle a new market the problem is that today we we, we see an increase of white labeling uh, services across the board financial services insurance and everything but um, you're losing, you're, you're right, you, uh, what we lose is uh, uniqueness uh, mm -hmm. because one brand now is not just identified for something very specific and, and you're losing the, the, um, the, the, the consumer or the customer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's what I was explaining on the previous point. Uh, now brand is very much about quantity and not quality. 
And you see that also in the emerging market where uh, in the past, very well famous uh, luxurious uh, brand in Europe, now they, they volume, uh, they mass market uh, brand. But he works very well in emerging market. But uh, uh, I think uh, all these brands are losing their soul. The loyalty of a brand doesn't exist anymore. So if you are an author, you know, you, 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 you very much have a unique type of product that, uh, that people might return to. For example, if you're a novelist and people have enjoyed your novels, they might come back to your future work and they might buy your new novel simply because they've enjoyed, you know, your previous work. So even though Foucault and uh, Barthes, you know, uh, you know, envisaged, envisaged a time where the author might be uh, anonymized, uh, might be removed from the branding and packaging of their work. Nevertheless, we, uh, for present purposes, we hold on to the notion of, 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 of ownership of work and intellectual property in the arts and in literature. How might, might climate change open up um, a kind of a new paradigm of intelligent data about weather events? So I'm really interested in how you see this relationship between climate change and technology and predictive um, systems um, evolving, you know, kind of going forward. A very interesting question because it it's connected again with the general trend of the human civilization evolution. I already mentioned before uh, Sir Arnold Toynbee theory of challenge and response, uh, where he says only the leaders who are creative will make their countries survive in a challenging environment. And, and that is also connected with the notion of the nation leader or so-called empire by Mr. Uh, Carol Quigley, who was the favorite teacher of Bill Clinton in Georgetown School of Foreign Service, who said that the nation leader is a producing nation capable of creating and recreating the instrument for expansion. And by those, he meant the scientific research, research and development, which is in cap capacitating you to produce the advanced systems, whether civil or military. So our company is deeply involved and we are probably one of the few or not to say the only private company in the world which is uh, involved in developing so-called numeric weather prediction software. We are uh, uh, an operational forecaster for both civil customers, uh, military customers, commercial customers, government customers, but we design the software which takes into consideration all the factors going on in the atmosphere and earth uh, and the thermodynamical exchange between those uh, and, and then try to predict. And Mikhail knows how difficult it is to predict the future in dynamic mm -hmm. systems where a lot of factors are you know, changing very quickly. And while you participate in developing such products, you're pushing the, the boundaries of, uh, of learning the environment. That pushes us to be as creative as possible, to use the most advanced instruments for data collection and measurement, and then data processing, quality assessment, and, and then try and predict the future. <laughs> I want to move to, to Michal here. And Michal, my question is quite broad and, and quite philosophical, <laughs> um, which, which I hope you like. Um, you, you've, your work at the, as I understand it, the Keenan Institute has engaged um, 
different but connected themes, ideological conflict, political ontology, and the political imaginary. And I suppose just looking at that little profile, I mean, I was, it's it's the last of those that's particularly of, of interest to me. I've done some editing myself of papers on uh, writers like uh, Zizek and, uh, and Baudrillard, um, who are also concerned about this, or have been concerned about this relationship between politics and the imagination, uh, and and how we how we imagine, how we fantasize the political arena. The technologies that are booming and accelerating perception of information or changing our lifestyles, they uh, increase the the force of ideology. They they make us more subjugated. And in a way, I, I also look at the novel of uh, Ali Blanc as a utopian way of dealing with this toxic influence of uh, illusions that social reality creates and mm -hmm. then cannot put under control. Uh, I, when I was listening to David, for example, speaking how the, the brand is changing, the, the, the role of brand is changing in, in contemporary society, it's also very much connected to it. There's this natural born uh, identity and there's a created identity of the, of the brand. Human personality itself is also doesn't have a fixated, uh, fixed, unchangeable self. It is rather a battlefield of the forces of duty, of superego, and of forces of wish, subconsciousness. And uh, if we are just a battlefield, uh, how can we uh, be able to resist also ideological external imageries? What can keep us together is the real. Not because we, we know it. Uh, ideally, the, this Lacanian theory, which seems to be quite correct, uh, real is uh, an absolute X. We, we can also say it's uh, the God or mm. something that cannot be uh, comprehended by a human mind. But the real, this instance, forces us to imagine. It seduces us to create. Uh, and it invites us to experiment. So in order to adapt, what Sergei was uh, telling, this adaptation is very important ability of human collectives. Adaptation includes imagination, and imagery is an important precondition for adaptation to happen. We have to experiment with different solutions before we find the one that actually resonates with the real. We still don't know what the real is, but we witness the re resonance. Yes. And Ali Blanc, in, in her novel, uh, she has a fantasy, uh, and she has this imagery of some therapeutic kind. I already mentioned this synth synthesicity of uh, Ali's uh, writing. But in this novel, imagery gives a gift of hope that the future is possible, and this future is not necessarily the uh, apocalyptic. Transition is possible, and the God woman promises it. So in a, while, in a way, this is a great seducer of the real God woman. Yeah. This question of storytelling in the context of your own project, I'm interested to know how you, how you understand it, what you think the importance of it is. And again, we're talking very much about evolution in this uh, conversation today, how you see it evolving in the context of, of technology, social media, uh, social platforms, podcasts, and so on. What's, what's your story about storytelling? I would start from <clears throat> very brutal fact. Maybe somebody believes, not, somebody believes it's not a fact. We survived as a humankind. We survived because of stories, thanks to stories. And, uh, you know, the book we are discussing today is, is some, that kind of story which will help us to survive. You know, I strongly believe in it. Um, because mm. we are trying to tell other people and this book is trying to tell us what will be after us. In particular, this book tells us how does artificial intelligence 
make us feel as a humans. Okay. And uh, you know uh, what I'm what I'm trying to tell, and what I see definitely in this book, there is a call for a call to adventure. True art is inspiring. This book is also inspiring to think about future, to think about some attitudes. Yeah, what what will happen next? Any closing remarks? Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, it was. A pleasure talking to you, and it was also an ironic that five wise men were discussing the issues of God womanhood. But otherwise, yes. I felt like the lack of participation of Ali with us. But we'll say yes. maybe uh, that was yeah. that was remarked that was remarked upon. Um, we're, we're all men pontificating about about women and gender. And obviously, we don't have the author with us today, but she's with us. She's with us in spirit.